Hello there, uh, I'm Ray Cohen, I've been asked to play a couple of tunes here for this. Uh, the first one is Banish Misfortune. They say it was a favourite jig of Dermot's and he named his first collection after. We have an open Q&A which you can contribute to throughout the evening. With, uh, you can use the chat option on your Zoom to contribute questions and uh, comments and I'll read them out later on. We also have our open mic, our popular open mic, which will be, we'll be featuring Seth Tuhi, um, Emily Foley and Maeve McCormick. Um, so I'm going to officially hand you over to Dr. Keith Hopper who will take it from here. Thank you, Keith. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. Thanks for your warm introduction. And uh, thank you and all the staff of, of Sligo Library for organizing this in such difficult times, but it's turned into such a wonderful online event. Um, and as Michelle said, this evening is a special edition of the word. Uh, normally we bring in writers to speak about their work. This is a celebration of the work of the late Dermot Healy. So with me to discuss the work this evening are two close friends and colleagues of Dermot's, uh, the poet Mary O'Malley and the writer and broadcaster Brian Layden. I'll just quickly introduce them. Um, Mary has published nine books of poetry. She's a member of Estona and is currently working on a memoir of childhood. Uh, and this autumn, uh, wonderfully, she's going to be awarded an honorary doctorate by NUI Galway, her alma mater, mine, um, and very, very well deserved. Uh, Brian Layden is a memoirist, a short story writer, a novelist, an editor, and a creative writing mentor. He's the author of, amongst other things, Sweet Old World, The Home Place, and Summer of 63. He's also a regular contributor to RT Radio 1. Um, I'll turn to Brian and Mary in a moment, but I, I just thought we might begin with a, a quick introduction to Dermot's work. Some of you I know have read his work. Some of you will be coming to it for the first time. And that's part of what we'd like to discuss. Why should we read Dermot's work? Why is he so significant and so important? And why is he not as well known, perhaps, as he should be? So these are all questions that we might usefully consider. But um, certainly from my own point of view, I came across Dermot's work when I was a student at uh, NUI Galway in, in the 80s. 
Um, but it was when a Goat song was published in 1994, and I vividly remember reading it. It was one of those great experiences. I stayed up all night to finish it. When I woke up the next morning with a, a reading hangover, I started it all over again because I wanted to figure out how he did it. It was something like a magician's trick. 20 years later, uh, myself and my co-editor, Neil Murphy, were invited by Dalky Archive Press to edit four books by and about Dermot. It was such a, such a privilege. And we did this with Dermot's um, blessing and approval. And unfortunately, just as the project began, uh, Dermot suddenly and unexpectedly died. So the whole idea was to celebrate Dermot's work and produce four books to collect the short stories, the collected plays, which was a huge volume, 600 pages. Uh, mm. His first novel, Fighting with Shadows, and this book, Writing the Sky, which Brian and Mary very graciously contributed to. And, um, and Dermot died, so it became an elegy as well as a celebration of his work. And what was really fascinating to me was the number of writers who turned up, who volunteered to, to contribute. And it really is a, a who's who of not just Irish writing, but you know, I'm just looking at the list here, like a Longley, Colm Tobin, Tim O'Grady, Pat McCabe, Tess Gallagher, Roddy Doyle, Glenn Patterson, Michael Harding, uh, Kevin Barry, Mike McCormick, Owen McNamee, Annie Poole, the great American writer, and on and on and on. You know, and it really was a great tribute to, to Dermot's work. Um, and so I think we noted in our introduction to this that it, it was kind of strange because outside of Ireland, Dermot's probably best known as a novelist, but um, he was also, as we see, an accomplished poet, a short story writer, a playwright, an actor, screenwriter, uh, a very generous man. He was a great literary enabler, as Brian and Mary will know. Um, he founded and edited regional journals, the Drumlin, and especially Force 10, which people in Sligo will remember. Brian was an editor. Um, he taught creative writing classes for prisoners as well as for local community groups. And I think that's a mark of Dermot's work too. It's a, a celebration of community spirit, but also there's a strong social conscience that's often overlooked. Um, the thing is though, what always struck me was that the, this fluency across a range of forms is kind of unique, you know? And I think that creative eclecticism might have complicated his critical reputation. If he had just stayed a poet, he'd be remembered as a poet. But the fact that he, he moves across genres so fluently, I think has complicated the, 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 the reputation. So that's what we concluded in, 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 in our introduction. We just said this, we said overall this volume of observations and essays serves as a tribute to a long overdue critical response to a hugely significant body of work. Most of all, it suggests that Dermot Healy is not just a great Irish writer, but a writer of genuine international importance. And that view hasn't changed, and I think it's strengthened over time. So that's why I, I, I thought we'd discuss with Brian and Mary, amongst many other things. Uh, Mary, I, I wonder if we turn to you first. Um, why, why read Dermot's work? What makes him so interesting as a writer, do you think? Well, one of the things that struck me preparing for this event and going back over certain, uh, uh, over the poetry specifically, because oddly enough, mm. I came through his other work, through his novels, which I absolutely love and yeah. um, was just flabbergasted by. I thought nobody else is writing about the people I grew up with like this, even though Dermot grew up in Cavan and various other places. Um, yeah. But of course he was, and, and I'm not just talking about the Sligo books. I felt the same in the memoir later on. Um, I think, first of all, he was just a brilliant writer. Secondly, he was technically absolutely, he was like a dancer, you know. Um, he reminds me more, it was interesting, Keith, when you were talking about why he wasn't better recognized. I always wondered about that. And I wondered whether there was an element of discomfort with what he wrote. Was it a bit close yeah. to the bone? <laughs> and yeah. uh, I don't think there is anybody else who covered that particular area of male crisis yeah and in in the way that dermot has um there was the or immigration indeed and the two often went together as we know um but i he reminds me very much of spanish writers where first of all it is not uncommon for people to cross genres you know yeah. it doesn't have this 
you, there isn't the same need to stick to the one genre as there is uh, we're used to identifying. Uh, the other thing about his novels, his prose and his theatre work is the connections are poetic in all of them. Yeah. Those sharp yeah. synaptic kind of cracks, you know, that jump from yeah. one thing to another. And it's all over his prose. Yeah. Um, and actually, he translated a very brilliant version of Blood Wedding by Lorca. So that's very much uh, part of the Spanish uh, connection. Yeah. And he loved the magical. Movies. Yeah. He did. He was yeah. a magical realist. I don't know who said, who coined that phrase about the um, surreal nature of the Gaelic imagination, if there is such a thing as the Gaelic imagination. And I always thought it applied utterly to Dermot. And the interesting thing was the one area we talked a lot about because he didn't really read in Irish. And yet, if you read Poirico um, Chonera, uh, Joriot, the Exiles, mm. it's astonishingly close in certain ways to how Dermot's novels worked on a certain level. Also about yeah. exile, of course, and yeah. very surreal. Um, yeah, and I, I, I remember when, sorry, when you contributed to uh, to writing the sky. I mean, it's such a such a fine book. I, I'm very proud of it. But it was the, again the eclecticism. Um, you, you, I remember you contributed two poems actually, and we only put in one because we, we thought if we put in two, and it was a toss up. <laughs> they yeah. were both equally great. But everyone, Brian Ladle would be complaining. Why don't, can't I have two pieces? Um, <laughs> Would you read some of some of the poems in memory of, of, of Dermot, just to give a flavour of, of your memory of him? Yeah. I will. I did something I have never done. I bookended playing the octopus with two poems. Uh, Dermot had died before it came out um, with two poems to Dermot um, because he was just, it seemed the thing to do. This is called A Lift and it's based um, on things that happened. Tell me. Is it all atomized energies or do the dead, as Baudelaire says, have bad hours? The world goes on as wicked as before or worse, whatever history says. Because of us, we like to think and not so sure. Remember the time we said a decade of tunes in the car to pass the time on the way to Derry. You giving the first one, no stuttering aloud, me answering. I'd like one more chat as we cross the border, four packed in the back, faces solemn for the soldier. Questions about fiddling styles, the long poem, you were against it. Where I stood on the baron and always the clouds parted and anything. Soho strippers, homeless boys, a sinking cruise ship could appear there out of nothing, like a flock of maybirds, because that's also how life is, pure magic. Hmm. Wonderful. And um, <laughs> the angel of Camden Street. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of mischief in that. <laughs> well done. Sorry. Thank you. He was full of the devil. <laughs> devilment. Life is full of devilment, I suppose. Uh, he had what they say a great blast on his life, you know, great taste out of it. Flavour. The angel of Camden Street. After Dermot died, I was I, I was staying in Dublin for some reason at work at the time and uh, I walked down Camden Street and I saw this amazing looking thing which was carved and it was this is about that and I bought it I thought oh if Dermot had was an angel that's what he'd look like after the funeral I found him in Camden Street I knew him by the wings the missing teeth he stood three feet high with a mad grin, Sweeney, if he'd been Indonesian. I paid him off and carted him back to the flat on the last instalment, hid him in the car boot until we got home. He found his plinth on a high stool in a corner, half nymph, half hermaphrodite. Dinner guests pointed out he had female parts and looked crazed. I hadn't noticed these angelic aspects neither the stylized hair nor the flat painted breasts as for the red lips a few anatomical oddities heavenly bodies come in all shapes and sizes oh half angel half bowsprit you're all i've got to send out to guard dermot in his trawler caught in a force eight night flying over sligo or ashore leer on the rocks scourge of angle grinding tourists 
he can come back when he tumbles late into heaven at the feet of some martyr, saying, I thought there'd be a serpent. And the Blessed Virgin looks ass up and asks, now who in the Lord is that? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Brian, that's, so that's, that's a good, a good, guardian. <laughs> a, a good way perhaps to link to Brian. I, I, I like that night flying over Sligo, because of course Trevor wrote some lovely poems about flying over Sligo and in a four eight storm. Definitely. I mean, that was uh, you, you, you lived in the same place, you were friends. And you, you were also one of the editors of Force 10. Maybe tell us something about Force 10. That, that's a remarkable part of Dermot's story. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, that's lovely, uh, Mary. Thank you for the poems. Um, yes, I was part of that, indeed. Um, I got to know Dermot around the time that Force 10 was starting up. That was the first actual issue of Force 10, which is a beautiful publication. Here, I have that mm. copy, you know. And this oh, was brilliant. produced at Dermot's house in Ross's Point at the time. I had won the Francis McManus Short Story Award, and uh, I actually had written a letter to the um, local papers. There was all these false wall building schemes going on. And I said they were like famine wall building schemes, and it was noted that I was unemployed and could show up for wall building. Um, but I heard that Dermot was uh, setting up a magazine, so I sent my story into him, and it was published in the first issue. And it's also got, if you'll notice, this drawing on the cover, charcoal drawing by another very uh, well-known artist out here in Maharao, that was Sean McSweeney, and it's the Poet's House. Dermot would move here to the poet's house right out on the edge. And if there was an edge, Dermot would be on it. That was a part of his life. Um, and I think it's Michael Wan, uh, the painter, has said that, you know, Sean McSweeney was the only artist who he knows who could draw the wind. And there are, there are imageries in Dermot's poetry as well, which is uh, drawn from the observations of Sean, which was that, you know, when graves were being dug here by the locals, that tradition, uh, they would be like oarsmen rowing the dead out to sea. So the fit between this sort of native environment and Force 10 seemed right, as it did for the rest of Dermot's imaginative output. It, it, it works its way into uh, a goat song and long time no see, especially, but also in the poetry. And here, the name Force 10, uh, it follows in a line where Dermot did actually, he did the Drumlin magazine when he was in Cavan. And that seems to have been influenced slightly by a tradition that goes back to Cavanagh as well, you know, and publishing these independent literary magazines. So it got going in 1989. And I used to say it was like the sun in Ireland. You never knew when it would actually reappear, but it was always welcome when it did. But when the schemes were going, there was a particularly, uh, there was a grouped, uh, of Force Tens, and they began began to take up a thematic unity. So there was one concerning mental health issues, which was largely dedicated to that, and another that coincided with the the flag call in Sligo at the time, and it became a, a traditional music special. And that's a beautiful phrase, Mary. You know the decade of tunes said in the car. He did that. Spanish myth. And yeah, he did. He was steeped <laughs> in music, um, and so there was a, a special issue with uh, traditional music issue. Dermot did a very long, well-researched piece on Michael Coleman and his daughter was in uh, Sligo at the time and uh, she was interviewed by Una Mannion and it was, it was a beautiful piece of work really. And yet, apart from Sean Dunn in Cork, poet and critic, and maybe some very mm. favorable, favorable interviews from Nulo Fuelon, it was slightly overlooked and Dermot always thought it was because it was seen as provincial, rural. It was seen that the people on it, though, there were artists, writers and photographers, that there were a false scheme and it was somehow a charity. Yet this magazine was publishing the more new writing than any other publication in Ireland, alongside really well known, including Seamus Heaney and others, you know, so and Neil and Bardwell and, and very fine writers like that. So an extraordinary publication driven by Dermot's kind of eclectic mind, as as you mentioned there, Keith, the broad reach and range of it, you know. Yeah. I remember the excitement of first time because a mix of, of, of images and, and, and interviews and stories. And yeah. But the fact that you have your first poem 
published beside Seamus Heaney and there was no hierarchy. It just felt so <laughs> yeah. powerful. Um, what, yeah. And also the interview, I, mean, I was telling students about this. Um, he developed a whole interview style. You were part of this. Mm. Strange. Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Did you want to say something there, Mary? No, I just thought that was a very important part of Force 10, the interview. Oh, yes. It, it was it was a key thing, and I think it became a training ground for a lot of writers because the, the principle was that, you know, the person doing the interview, you'd have your prepared questions, you'd try and direct and lead the interview, but you listened very closely and you you wrote it down by hand what the person was saying and you kept the questions off the paper so it became just the voice of the interviewee. And the fact that you would write it by hand and not put a tape recorder down, which can throw people out, and it seems sort of pro, it seems almost as a blood, that there's some, some kind of membrane between the interviewer and the interview when you put a recording instrument there. So you wrote it down by hand, and the beauty of that was that you could tell the person, listen, I've not finished your sentence, could you just pause? And well, I finished that. And that gave the interview time to gather their thoughts and collect their thoughts. So you actually got a truer picture, no him and an and less him and han, as we'd say, and actually much closer to the actual voice. And then you did it and you had a chance to type it up. And it largely came out that way, though you would edit and manipulate maybe the place and to get a, a kind of a narrative across the interview. But that worked extraordinarily well. And I applied it to an interview I did with Dermot himself, you know, uh, mm. Keith, that you were involved in the Buzz magazine and you were quoting from it, you know, in uh, mm. re reading the sky, writing the sky, I should say. And it just showed the worth of it to me that even it, it came back to Dermot that we got some of his voice there in, in things like that. So, yeah, that became a great training ground for writers, that interview process. I had, and also, as, as you say, rightly, you know, it was regarded as provincial when it was anything but. It was so mm -hmm. sophisticated. Yeah. I have actually yeah. part of your interview here, Brian, uh, with Dermot in that style. But he talks about moving to Mara, moving to your mm -hmm. part of the world. And it's flooded the poetry, the fiction, the playwriting I do. In a few short years, this landscape has provided me with half the poems in the Valley Town Colors mm -hmm. and some of the hidden figures in the boat song. And he's got a lovely phrase and he just says, I'm immensely grateful for that. If there's a magic, you'll find it in yourself at last in a proper place. Mm. What yes. Yeah. In a conversation, you know. Beautiful. Yeah. So play yeah. is important. Yeah. Um, uh, and yes, and, and I think in terms of the beautiful place, I mean, people, you're saying, why, why the, the appeal Dermot has, what is, there was a kind of an oceanic forlornness within Dermot himself that the that an, was answered by the sea and being near the coast and and uh, the peaks and troughs of the sea itself, like the peaks and troughs in his own creative life and in his own mind and his own life, um, that a, when a writer finds the right place, it was an extraordinary creative flowering and renaissance in terms of the Dermot experienced here in Ballyconnell by the coast, not least for the the barnacle geese that fly over here, you know, like a, a cosmic clock and and Dermot out in his garden watching them and getting into a kind of a rhythm of a man who had a kind of a chaotic, maybe not chaotic, but very restless. And as you say, and that's reflected in the number of genres he crossed and the, and the publication and the playwriting and his his uh, the, the, the trawl of creative writing groups. Remember, Force 10 came out of from Bell Mullet up to Killy Beggs and taken in the Sligo writers and up to Leitrim and the Barrel Store. And that was yeah. happening, yeah. 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 So there was a groundedness here and also that kind of tidal impermanence and change and flux and the possibility that, you know, while there's accumulation, there's obliteration going on in mm -hmm. parallel by the sea. Yeah. Mm. Mary, I mean, how, how does all this play out in the poet, you know, as a professional practicing poet? Yeah. You know, what, what's oh. about Dermot's poet? Why it's so good? I, I think, well, just to go back to the sea, because I write almost, it's occasionally been mm. suggested that I write about anything else, but um, mm. uh, there's an, a very important point to make, and it's, it was true of Richard Murphy in a very different way. Dermot knew the sea from working on boats. 
So there was as one of the reasons his poetry is so strong is because as as with his prose, his descriptions, his images are very solid. I don't mean that they're uh, prosaic. I mean that they're solid. And um, they're they're true. That's the word I mean. So I think the fact that he had done that, that he had worked on boats, he'd worked with fishermen, he knew the sort of life and the extraordinary resilience you have to have for a life like that. Uh, mm. He had no romanticism at all about it, which is one of the things that makes the poetry brilliant. I mean, one of the, uh, just thinking again today, how utterly lacking in sentimentality the poetry is, and yet full mm of that hits you right in the solar plexus. Um, for example, he has that magnificent poem on immigration, uh, which starts in, which goes to London. It's, it's just ostensibly about Larkin's room. Um, but in fact, it just takes you on, it just gives you these tiny vignettes and ending up back on the windswept peninsula, shouting into the wind mm -hmm. again, you know. And I think, um, one of the things I'm most impressed by in the poetry, Keith, is his technical virtuosity. Mm. I mean, he's really technically very, very uh, astute and uh, supple and um, sure-footed as well. Uh, could I read mm. one of the poems, do you think, to illustrate what we're talking about? Okay. <clears throat> Grounded at any come ashore. The sea is on nights, the sea is on nights. The horizon is an empty factory floor. If you step outside, you'll see the day shift past the night shift on the second shore. The lights from the airport stream across the bed. Oh, am I frozen? No, no. Yeah. The lights from the airport stream across the bed of the ocean, but someone has missed the bend for home. They keep going till they could go no longer. Stand at any come ashore, you'll see the ship grounded like a casino at Balancar. Love with all its lights on. In the third house from the left, I'm stuck high and dry in a fiction that won't end and a love affair that ended. Like the stranded poles, I'm waiting for the high waters of late September to make me buoyant again, to fill each side of me. Till then, I'm here, unable to carry on. Mark me on the second beach waiting for the pilot, or on the prom at night watching the silent gulls in a gale, hundreds falling in one in, one behind the other, just about the, above the water for hours steadfastly. Uh, and just the bend for home, of course, used again there. Um, but the notion of missing the bend for home a car going through a wall yeah. probably you know which often happens on country roads at night and taking yeah. that into this um uh metaf almost metaphysical level and back again yeah yeah and and mary it's worth um you know people taking heart you're on about dermot's technical virtuosity he was self-taught largely dermot you know didn't have that we major were. schooling <laughs> You know, he, he he learned as he went, and he he or he had a gift, you know. But um, he 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 was a man who, you know, that that was the application to what he did. It was so important to him, and there was a little bit of almost a fright there. He'd give himself um, with his intensity of what he he got and needed from the writing. I think um, you reminded me. There's a little house with the mention of the sea uh, in. I think it's my favorite collection of Dermot's poems, What the Hammer, and it's second, uh, I think it follows Ballyconnell Colors, and yeah. he um, yeah. he collection. has a poem in that called My House is Tiny, and he says, my house is tiny and my sorrow is the smallest at this end of the country, and yet the whole sea at my back can fit into the most frightened human mind. And mm, uh, if you live by the sea, you get you know that if you knew Dermot, you know exactly what he meant. And you were asking about the f fiction as well, Keith. There's something I was thinking, trying to sum it up, and I was saying, you know, the fiction especially, but so too do the um, poems. There's always a bit something of an abandonment and the frightened, 
feeling of abandonment. There's a recurring image of empty rooms and maybe a ghostly cough or a cat sneezing in a room that is where there's not that's empty. And there's a sense uh, kind of as as he deals with the desperately strange and the strangely desperate um in the later novels especially like sudden times and even mm. long time no see where there's kind of a sense of dementia creeping in there or senility and it captures that slippage you know um and that fright that kind of slight fear held with a kind of noble courage as your only kind of way to put a break on that fear but, but that, one... that's all dermot's themes you know yeah, one of the things I found really valuable about Dermot's novels, though, was the notion that the, there was very little conformity in his uh, <laughs> characters. They were very complex, real characters. They were often funny. They spoke obliquely uh, about worlds that were existing right beside the one they were in. Um, take, you know, Long Time No See, uh, where all sorts of other words come into the conversation. But in actual fact, that happened. And sometimes there was mental illness. You know, there were signs of uh, actually something serious. Um, but very often there wasn't. There was an illusion and allu people alluded mm -hmm. to things that weren't there in a way, almost like the Latin Americans did, which is perhaps mm -hmm. why we found magic realism so immediately uh, comprehensible and um, at least I remember first reading Borges and it made total sense to me in a way um, <laughs> because the, it was the old story of, you know, do you believe in the next life? No, but it's in it all the same. Or do you believe in fairies? No, but they're in it all the same. Um, and, and I loved that life going on side by side in people's lives and sort of butting in occasionally in the novels uh, yeah. into the, the, yeah. He wasn't a fan of the closed narrative in that respect. And I no. think that was a great strength, you know. Uh, when we're talking, Keith, about that and we're what Mary is on about, I mean, she 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 really does nail a lot of the, the truths and this obliqueness uh, that was at Hallmark. Why, as you were saying, he is the writer's writer because, you know, so much literature can almost be transposed directly onto the screen. It follows so many of the tropes of storytelling. But that obliqueness that Mary refers to is all over the place, that hauntedness and that illusion, Ill, slightly what kind of very nebulous divide, thin membrane between us, as Mary rightly says, almost a hallucinatory and the illusory and the, the material world. Um, you sent a sample out to some of the students, Keith, I uh, think, and there was a piece collected, which isn't in the short story collections that I'd known until you brought out the collected short stories there with um, Dalkey. Um, and uh, there was a piece in that called Images. And if I may, it's about a minute and a half too. Will I read that to give you a flavor, I suppose, of what we're talking about with Dermot's work? Um, and this yeah. is from a 2013 piece, I think, called Images. I'm going to cut into it now and just take this bit because it highlights what Mary was talking about and yourself there. Um, in this excerpt, Jack, he's a retired IT <laughs> lecturer there, and uh, he's uh, sometime uh, has an interest in photography, but you'll get a sense of his interest in a moment. Uh, Jack, his car is broken down, so he hires Miss Jennifer to drive him around. And they're um, in the locality, in the landscape that Dermot is rooted in here. So it says, as we drove round the lake, the waves stuttered as mist flew over. This valley is renowned for rain, he said. All of a sudden, there was a rap of hailstones on the, wind on the windscreen. Ah, Mother Nature can be very articulate, he said. Then it was up a side road to another deserted cottage on the side of the mountain. He tried the door and opened it. He disappeared inside and was gone for some time. Up above, sheep climbed up the sheer side of Ben Bulban and hung there like markers. Old paths crossed over. Down below, tractors passed with piles of the first cut of grass in their trailers. When he stepped out, he was shaking his head and said, look, 
and he showed me the photographs in the camera, all in black and white. The first shot was taken from inside a room in the house and was aimed facing a window through an old wooden crucifix that once held glass panes that looked down on a steep, dangerous fall to the valley and the lake below. Now, look at these, he said. In the next appeared a kitchen table with a bottle of Jemison whiskey, quarter full, sitting mid-centre, then two chairs facing each other, an old metal ashtray, and finally an Irish independent newspaper from years back. We walked in and looked at the scene. What do you make of that? He lifted the newspaper, gone wet and black at the edges, with the print slipping into the unreadable, and read out the wandering headline concerning Vietnam, and then placed it back exactly where it had been. As we headed outside to the car, a farmer driving black and white sheep and newly born lambs appeared in the lane. Hello, not too bad class of a day, he said. We just looked inside the cottage, said Jack. Oh yeah, just taking photographs. I'm sure the Brady's wouldn't mind. I'm glad to hear it. Did you ever see that bottle of whiskey? No, not me. I have never once stood in that house since they've gone. I couldn't. I just heard the story from the neighbours. The brothers took off for America back in the 60s. The hired car came and off they went, off leaving everything behind exactly as it was. There was they were great in fairness to them. I, until the house, had been empty a long time and since then. Jesus Christ. And there's no relations in the area? One day the boys might come back. So there you go. Good luck, folks. Take care. And he headed on down with the sheepdog, racing and circling at the front. Now, said Jack, history is a password. And that's from hmm. images. Wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. yeah. yeah there's a lot I, I, of dirt in that. Mm. Mm. But it's interesting too, isn't it? You know, the fact that Dermot excelled in so many different forms, it seems to me there's late fiction benefits from this. The descriptions yeah. are incredibly poetic. And then the conversations there, you know, this is a very skilled dramatist who's used to dialogue. Yeah. You always know he's speaking, even though he doesn't have he, sh he said, she said. It flows so beautifully. Yeah. And it's always rooted in the place. I was very struck collect uh, actually editing the collected stories was amazing because I realized I mean, look, nearly every story does mention a house of some kind. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. I took the text I was it was quite cheekily. I ran through a word cloud, you know, where you can see the key words and the biggest word in it, house. So I love the fact that his last story was about this exploring these abandoned strange houses where memories and traces of lingering. It seemed very dramatic, actually. Mm -hmm. I can do that actually in reality as well. <laughs> I remember in Balmullet being brought out to various places on these these wonderful sort of little excursions you'd end up going on with Dermot because he had somewhere he wanted to check out. And yeah. Uh, yeah. it was it was it was usually a house. <laughs> of some sort from Bundorn to Bob Mullet. Um, could I just read a very tiny uh, section, is there time, from Dermot's yes, yes, uh, Long Time No See? Yes, please do. Lovely. Uh, just an example of uh, what I was talking about earlier, perhaps, mm. that moment between the worlds. I brought water to the sick cow who was lying in the meadow looking out to sea, did three lines after mass, the teachers, the bankers and the Germans. Then I went to the wall at the back of the house. I was out there building stones for three hours. I'd been at this dry stone walling for three weeks on and off and it was good work. All you needed was a length of string, a few rocks and a sense of balance. Sometimes I'd be building walls in my dreams. Some of the stones I used had come inland in storms, but today I started to haul from an old ruin up on the bank overlooking the sea. I got an awful bad feeling as I pulled the rocks out of the ruin. I had to tell myself over and over that they were going back into another wall. 
The ruin was supposed to have been a hen house, but it was the strongest looking hen house I ever came across. There were massive stones in her. I could have been demolishing a small church and sometimes I thought I was. A beehive hut it might have been, a monk's chamber. I could even feel the sense of balance of the man who had built it. He drew the stone from the coral beach by ass and cart to the spot I was taking them from. As he built alongside me, I was pulling his work down. So it goes on. Wonderful. And that mix of absolute concrete description of building a wall and the man beside him who had built the previous wall. Um, yeah. In long time, no see. Um, I mean, the, it, it was very, yeah. Very grounded. Just something I was just very grounded and I, I think I remember that passage so well when I read it first because remember the character in it the young boy Mr. Psyche that's right. it, it's it's just... from some unspecified trauma I don't know what it is until the end it's just the loss of a very close friend and yeah. it's only through coming back to that work the building of the stone wall that connects him with the land yeah. and the past that he begins to find his his feet again it's such a beautiful simple thing but I, I was just struck by the integrity of it he's not afraid to take this up and see what those kind of fractured broken yeah. people it's very beautiful. nor are the community afraid to deal with them that's the interesting thing about Dermot's work they weren't just hived off into institutions or classified all the time I mean there was that element people did go to hospital yeah. but there was people accepted the mind not being all right at certain times in a way yeah. that for all the talk of it i'm not sure we do anymore and yeah. i i i really value that aspect of dermot's writing especially yeah. in the country you know that's very true mary um this um that's a really you know profound insight as to how even this community where dermot chose to live um yeah. it is notable but there is great scope and room made for people, you know, no matter what uh, you do, whether it's the writer on the cliff edge, you know, or it's the guy who's building walls or the, the member of the family who's not going to thrive in a more cosmopolitan or a, you know, demanding setting. There is room made. Not only that, there is a role found for you that is meaningful and meaningful to the community and meaningful to you. And that that is a hallmark of here that Derma captured very much and engaged with. Yeah. yeah. And it's interesting that it's been neglected, that aspect of a community accepting to a certain extent. I don't want to over, you know, over egg this. Um, that people will go in and out of what's called healthy mental health, if you like, these days. Um, mm. Just, you know, that pe that the world hurts people, I suppose. Mm. I remember reviewing that book when it first came out and being really powerfully struck by the sense of place and um, a sense of community. And I remember I, I was living in England. I never read a book that made me so homesick for Sligo for all of that qualities that he celebrated. And I was very struck by some of the other reviews. There was quite a hostile review in the Irish Times, and there was a good it's robust not. debate before, um, the late Eileen Battersby. But um, I thought that you know, Eileen got it wrong because it was a kind of Dublin perspective, and I, I, a feeling that somehow people didn't actually understand the West, and Dermot got it. And I think, something there there was a kind of cosmopolitan attitude that crept in in certain reviews that didn't like the very thing that made me homesick that made me weep that makes us so privileged to have known this man. yeah you can have capitalism in capital city sometimes can't you <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and mary what you said there the world the world hurt dermot with that book uh, because uh, there was a joke in the title, of course, because there was a very long pause. He was writing the poetry, plays, doing everything. So, uh, you know, publishers who had dealt out advances and loved a goat song and the other stuff uh, were waiting for another novel that never appeared. And Dermot called it Long Time No See. And there was a little kind of a, uh, yeah, you know, that, that that's for the publishers and the reading public as well, thinking Long Time No See. Uh, so there was that element of, 
uh, for Dermot Hurt because he, a lot was riding on that novel and he wanted that response, mm. you know. So it was difficult and frustrating for him and a challenge. And um, it's 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 tough when you invest that level of yourself and your world and your creativity. And it's just don't get it. As you say, it's being got now and there's a catching up. And look at the kind of, I believe we have a full house this evening, you know, of people who are interested in what Dermot had to say and that his achievement stands out more and more because of it's just not that orthodox. He's in a modernist tradition, but he's he's other things as well, you know. I think he's utterly think... relevant mm -hmm. for the next gen, the, the, the current generation, you know. A lot of the isolation that people are experiencing in a different way, of course, a lot of the um, questioning of roles, uh, you know, um, where things aren't black and white. Yeah, I think yeah. Dermot's work will be increasingly read in Ireland. I hope it will. Yeah, I hope so too. Can I can I just read one poem of his because I know likelihood is that Dermot had great great support and ally here in his community, but also from Helen, his partner, who was, um, you know, uh, um, made accommodate made accommodated herself to a, a testing life here, testing life with a writer and a testing life with the ferocity of the elements here in Maharao. You know, where the local fishermen would even say, "It's so windy, the devil must be stuck around here." And and uh, but there's a beautiful poem in What the Hammer, which is dedicated to Helen. And I'd like to read that. It's called The Serenities. And it also captures the life here and what you were talking about as well. The house again, back to that house. Uh, a fire lit, candles burning, the animals in last weather report, giving warm breezes from the south, our love making sweet and just before sleep, thoughts like prayer. Then the dark, where when you turn, I turn, as if we were for one beautiful moment looking the same way from some height at something moving slowly out of sight. Uh, Maybe that's a good point to uh, bring the serenity of that together. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on timer, and I know Michelle is probably fielding questions from the Q and A. We have a big audience, a very big, eager audience. So I'm sure um, Ryan and Mary would be happy to field questions. Okay, so um, we've had some lots of comments and um, lots of comments and um, and questions throughout the evening. So from Mary Maeve McCormick, uh, when you were reading earlier on, Mary O'Malley, she was commenting on how beautiful your poetry are. Poetry is um, Mary's poems make Thanks. me laugh and cry. She said. Um, from Audrey Robinson, emotive, funny and beautiful. Uh, regarding the conversation on Force 10, Maeve McCormick says, I agree, Force 10, very unrecognised outside the Northwest. Tony Keenan says, if there was an edge on Dermot, if, it, if there was an edge, Dermot would be on it. Oceanic forlorn forlornness. Brian, I love it. Very well spoken. Um, yeah. And Brian, when you were just reading there just lately, there uh, there's comments from Audrey Robinson, lovely animated reading from Kira Rowan. That was fabulous, Brian. From Maeve McCormick, she says, until this week, I had never read his short stories or poetry, only novels and plays. And thanks to the word for prompting her, which is great. I hope everybody gets a chance to read. Um, I'm blown away from how flowingly he can write in different mediums. And Tom Kavanagh comments how haunting his, story, his writing is. Um, there's a question here from Maeve O'Hare. She was wondering, Dermot has an interest in etymology. Do you think it shaped much of his work? So that's the first question. Do you want to Over answer to first, Mary? Well, I would just, I'd be surprised if any poet didn't have what, an interest in etymology, first of all, uh, whether consciously or not. And uh, I think it informed the work probably. I'm not sure whether it shaped it or not, but I would certainly say it informed it. Um, we himself and Kieran Carson again had a, both had an interest in the arcane, and I remember off many discussions about and wordplay that would follow from it, which is more to the point, I think. But but yeah. also, you know, um, 
interrogating where a word might have started and uh, especially if the word happened to have started in Irish because then there was lots of room for argument and discussion and fun. Um, so I think, mm. yes, I think that's perceptive, yeah. I th yeah, and I think um, there was, wasn't, I don't know that, I don't, I'm not classically trained in the languages and that, that uh, Dermot, I remember, had a fascination with the idea that the origins of tragedy, tragos, is from a goat's a cry, goat. a goat on an island, and that the goat's song, like a tragic thing. So the, he, he was, he was hardwiring that into that title there. And, and he would, he was writer in residence in Mayo and he used to take off from Sligo and he'd often be going through Corbala, which is the bend for home, I think as well. So uh, he was, you know, he, he, as you say, Mary, it was like playful noticing eye where, <laughs> where the word just, just triggers something in him that's just a fit for the occupation, yeah. And I think that wonderful, I mean, there used to be these competitions, you know, particularly in Irish, but I think they existed in English as well. They were fun nights where you would, somebody would throw out a line and somebody would give a line back, especially in the macaronic. They still exist in Irish with the Lubini, you know, and the, you'd see them in the flowers and so on. Great. And Dermot had a great sort of sense of play in language, um, which I, I miss actually. I miss hearing more of that. There's a lot of seminars and so on, but I, I just love a weekend of fun, play occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that I think also is worth pointing out here is that so much can come up in good conversation for a writer. You know, it's a lonely old life a lot of the time. And when you get together and hear people like now, um, things, you know, whether it's a word or an idea. Yeah. Um, we have another question from Maeve McCormick. She she says, "Where do you think his plays sit in his body of work?" Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think, I, I mean, the, 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 Keith will tell you more than I can on this, but I, I know that there's such a huge volume of work, but. Uh, they were, you know, again, they had hit and miss reception. They were, you know, there were small turnouts sometimes in the in the Hawkswell uh, for plays. But on Broken Wings, when you see a play like that, you say, well, it's time to start looking more closely at what he was trying to do here and what he was attempting, because that's a haunting piece of work. He uses masks and gesture and... And, and very innovative and seems to touch on his themes. I think when he gets it right, he gets it right. Some of the, there are some smaller pieces, maybe they're a bit more fragmentary. And a lot of them, I remember, were done in community settings where he worked exactly. with uh, citizens groups and that. Yeah. So, yeah, it, Keith probably knows more than I do. But yes, when he, when he you know, there's a substantial works like on Broken Wings, then, yeah, they're worth revisiting as well. I think there's 13 plays in the collected works, and we should also pay tribute to Dawkey Archive. The publisher, John mm. O'Brien, has recently died. So is no more. But no one would have given us such license. So I kept saying to John, look, I'm gathering the plays. And I remember memorably going over to the Dermot, and he, he gave me the plays and photocopied in <laughs> envelopes. And, and then floppy disks. There was plays on floppy disks, and there was all kinds of madness. So we, we managed to get it all together. And I kept saying to John Brian, I don't know how big this book is going to be. Say 300 pages. And I was pulling this. It turned out to be 600 pages. Like these, this was a substantial body of work. Brian is right. There are, I think, I think Dermot loved Unbroken Wings. I'm so delighted that when the book came out, that, the, uh, that it was performed again. And that was one of our intentions. But there's a few other gems in there. Uh, Mary mentioned the, the Spanish influence. The version of Lorca's book winning is worth a revival. I think, and there's a few, and as Brian says, some of them, it's because of residency. So he wrote one in the in, 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 with prisoners, Prison. and the prisoners yeah. performed it themselves. He wrote one for school kids. Imagine Dermot Healy, you know, coming into the Mercy Convent and you're, being your your creative writing teacher, and they wrote the play themselves. And you know, so yeah. some of them, you know, are flimsy because of the context in which they emerge. But there's something about the spirit of it, and he writes brilliantly, as Mary said too, about. It's a wonderful play set in the Hebrides about the loss of the land 
and people forced to emigrate. And he captures the intensity of that. So I think, yeah, it's a mixed movie, but I really do recommend anyone looking for a play, take a look at that volume, and I think you'll find gems. Definitely, Gorkat is worth a revisit. Um, Sean Golden says, his plays were often sheer theatre, non-verbal spectacle and performance, and so not amenable to the teaching of text that seems to consolidate literary canons. If you'd like to comment on that. Yeah, yeah I, would, I, I would agree, Sean. I think you did a lot in that. I mean, um, there's without a doubt, Dermot, uh, he was as interested in the silence as he was in 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 the word, the text, and the words there, and the sounds and gestures and uh, goodness. We we used to when he when he take out his uh, his Mongolian throat singers tapes and uh, he. But uh, it was it was usually a sign to go home then actually, but uh, he would he was was interested in the sound of things and that gesture and that in the things that cannot be articulated any other way. So yeah, not always amenable to um to on the page they have some of them are like ladders, you know, tight step ladders down the page of text. And I think it was Kevin Barry who, who was influenced and has embraced that influence, you know, and acknowledged it. But, the, you know, as Sean said, on the page, you say, what are we going to do here? You have to start listening to the silence and you have to start listening to the sounds and you have to think about the gesture mm -hmm. as well. Quite right. Because yeah. I think he was a theatre maker as much yeah. as, uh, as a, a yeah. writer of text. Theater, if you know what I mean, and in a particular tradition, again, you think of the French, the little theatre posh, the little pocket theatres that sprang up here and there. I mm. think Dermot of Dermot in that tradition as well. Um, but I think it is very important was... to acknowledge that the plays were community. Yeah, community. Yes, in some very much so. Yeah. I'm just looking very here's the very inclusive. I mean, yeah, it's a big chunk of the thing, and I, I love the color image. It's Dermot having the first play that the Hacklers in Cavan did, won the All-Ireland Amateur Drama, and Dermot had directed it. So you direct your first play and it wins the Amateur Drama competition. Mm. And here they are out at the Peacock Theatre. And I love the photograph. I don't know if you can see it. Sorry, I'm moving different ways. And there's, there's Dermot in the picture underneath the Peacock. He's the only one looking not into the camera. He's looking, looking into the distance, looking like the Peacock. Uh, and at the beginning of, of a very interesting dramatic I do suggest there's a one thing called Women to the Left, Men to the Right, which is built, again, community drama, getting all people to recall through that interview style that Brian described so well, to describe their memories, and then harness it into a piece of drama. That, that was performed in the Peacock in Dublin. And again, I think it's a text that's worth revisiting if people are interested in doing it. Those plays for voices, it would also make an incredible radio play. Yes, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Keith, it strikes me that we can't leave the theatre either because it would be very remiss. Uh, I really, really loved what Dermot was doing with Samuel Beckett's, you know, Crap's last tape, and he'd had uh, Des Brayton perform in that as Crap, and it was, a, it was an amazing performance done in the Trades Club, and Tani uh, Bentis, uh, his partner. Uh, did Rockabye, I think, and um, the, 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 the astonishing thing, Dermot was actually, that was on his mind again, one of the last things on his mind and projects again, was that he had the original recordings where Des was a much younger actor doing crap, you know, so uh, crap listens back to his life in these tapes, and it would have been astonishing to have the much older actor play his own voice, his own tapes as a much younger man. They, the re, the groundedness and the real sense of reality that would give a show would have been just astonishing um, to mm -hmm. a, a true continuity with what Beckett had in mind. Uh, and it would have been mm -hmm. deeper because Dermot had staged it so far back. So that, that, that on Broken Wings and that, that as a director and putting his hand to it, he an incomparable director. Mm. That's a valuable point. In the end, the title of production is called Waiting for Dermot in honor of mm -hmm. Beckett influence. And again, mm. I do know that Beckett scholars have read this with great interest. Mm. 
because they feel that there is a strand in that that's worth emulating. So I'm just looking over at Michelle here. I wonder, are we exceeding our time? Yeah. We're definitely coming to the end now. We've just got the final few comments. So there's a comment there. No surprise that Annie, Anne Pru, well, Annie Pru was a fan, Maharao and Maine. Um, we've a comment just in the last discussion there from Ben Butler. One of the prisoners in Castle Ree remarked many years after acting in Dermot's play, Serious, I still remember my lines. Dermot's work in prison gave meaning in a place where it was hard to find. So that's a comment on that. And then the final comment is, those prisoners were the authors of their own lines. Dermot conducted them like a conductor leads an orchestra. Yeah. So that was reaction to the last one. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. So that's kind of it for this discussion. I don't know if you want to add anything more to the last few comments there. We're well, just I coming just to like the to end. <laughs> well, I, it would just be it's it's so typical of the man that that comment about the prisoner feeling that you know they're there where we went back to their mary um people who are on the margins excluded and maybe the community finds difficulty embracing fully yeah, embraced there that. and that, that honored and yeah. their words honored yeah and lives honored not just lip service you know he really did mm. good fitting tribute thank you thank you Thanks, everyone. Um, I just want to say just the last, just a final thing. Thanks to all presenters, Keith. I haven't read Long Time to See, but it'll be my next book, and that's from Anne to everyone. And I just want to say, as somebody said earlier on, um, the word prompted them to find and discover more work by Dermot Healy. And I suppose that's all we want to do at The Word, is just inspire everyone to discover new writers and old writers and new work by old writers and old work by new writers, you know. So that's what we want you to do and get going and get look and discover. So we're, we're glad that everybody got to enjoy this and got to uh, learn more and discover more um oh just one and one more cam, uh, comment from helen gillard Karen gallon players went on to win the all ireland drama festival in 2019 not with on broken wings so that's interesting oh, thanks, um okay. and it, it's it's um poignant that we finish with the final song um from ray cohen and it's it's departing glass which i know was um also used mm -hmm. in his funeral so um this is a, a, a perfect ending thank you very much thanks everyone so the parting glass, not much to say about it, like a, a song for a while I'm away and there's a little, a little reel in the middle of it as well, the man of Aaron. Spend it in good company And all the harm I've ever done Alas, it was to none but me And all that I've done for one to time for to sit a while there is a sweet heart in this town that surely has my heart beguiled her rosy cheeks and ruby lips I own she has my heart and throb oh but fill for me the parting glass go
good night and joy be with you. Of all the comrades here I have, they are sorry for my going away. And all the sweet hearts here I they would wish me one more day to stay But since it's fell unto my lot That I should rise and you should not I gently rise and I softly Good night and joy be with you all. Thank you, Ray. That was absolutely beautiful. Our first open mic now is going to be Seth Tuhi. So welcome, Seth. Hi, um, this is Dr. James, sir. Um, I wrote it while working on a piece about Dr. James Barry for my course portfolio. Um, for those who don't know who he is, um, he was from Cork and spent most of his life traveling around the world as a surgeon in the British Army. He's probably best known for having performed one of the first caesarean sections where both mother and child survived, but he was also very concerned with the welfare of the vulnerable. Um, the person who prepared his body after death described him as a perfect female. If Barry was alive today, it's likely he would consider himself a transgender man, but who knows. <clears throat> Dr. James, sir. Dr. James, sir, how did it feel for your man constantly hiding? Be a doctor only for as long as that secret held. Be a gentleman surrounded by such poverty. To never have a home that was solely yours. Be Irish under British rule. To never be able to return to Cork. To not see those you grew up with ever again. To make your own way in the world, alone. To forgo romantic entanglements for your own safety. Over you. Dr. James, sir. Did you choose your name, or was it yet another forced upon you? There are so many out there, James, Miranda, Stuart, Margaret, Barry, Bulkley. How many are truly you? Gentlemen, Dr. Dandy, those who embraced and strove to be. Daughter, lady, niece, did you ever truly belong with them? Dr. James, sir, were you a man of God? Did you enjoy ripe fruit, fresh bread, soup when it was cold? Did you read? Enjoy the theatre. What did you do in your spare time? Why did you name your dog Psyche? Was it Danison who always travelled with you? Who was he? Was he your faithful manservant, closest friend, your lover? Who were you underneath the uniform and doctorate? What were you like as a person? Dr. James, sir, did you think you'd be remembered thusly? Did you know how you were making history when you did it? Did you care? Dr. James, sir, did it hurt? Were you in pain? Were you scared? Did you cry? Pray to your God? Did you think of giving up? Dr. James, sir, when it happened, when you were just James again, no longer powerful, stripped of the work you defined yourself with, were you lost, afraid? Did it make you feel young again, when you had so little to get you through? Dr. James, sir, how did you do it? 
not slip up, not let anyone know. Keep your past locked up so tightly that even 150 years after your death, it's still hidden. Dr. James, sir, I admire you and your passion and courage throughout everything you endured. I admire the care you gave to those who needed it the most, those who are the most vulnerable in society, even if it caused you hassle and pay and respect. I wish I could see you, red hair, pea green coat, thigh high boots, and ask you these questions myself. I wish I could wrap my arms around your too thin body and say, me too, tell you you aren't alone and we believe in you. I want to travel to Kensal Green and bury my fingers in the dirt there. Tell my thoughts, the block of stone recording your existence as Inspector General of Hospitals. Thank you, Dr. James, sir, for making me believe that I have a chance in all this, like you did. Thank you, Seth. That was amazing. Absolutely fabulous. Um, next, we have up um, Emily Foley, please. Um, yes. Well, can um, um, two very quick poems I did, literally be in a few seconds. For context, it's about um, a very chaotic morning where my sister was born, and at the same time, our horse had a foal, which was great. Um, the first one is about that foal. It's called Storm. The crashing of the trees made her bolt for the Alp. The colt avalanche into this world in the quagmire, abiding in the lowland. Confused, he then took his early steps with an insecure composure. He fell into the ditch. His mother followed afterwards. And this is the second poem called Don't Dawdle. Crushing downwards to the bottom of the bluff, this alluring blizzard crisp day is a good day. It is a school day, sorry. My character ca capsizes. Come on now, you'll miss the bus, mother warns. She seems abnormally isolated packing me off in the direction of the bus, assuming that it were a natural light. She was suddenly ill-tempered with my old man. Stop dithering, get washed, get ready, get the car. And there you go. Thank you, Emily. Another amazing new voice. It's great to hear it's such a completely different way of um, creating new, new voices. Um, our final open mic for the evening is Maeve McCormick. Thank you, Maeve. How you doing? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, this is just an extract from a, a story I'm writing. <clears throat> Paula was always confused at how sometimes the beach was there one night and covered in water the next. When she was about seven, she realised the tide might disappear, but it always came back. Sixteen years later, she sat in her favourite spot on the floor of her bedroom, breasts against her knees, arms gently hugging them. Compacted in a sitting position in the frame of a floor level slash window, she was listening for the sound of the sea between the drafty wood and das. Some summer twilights, you could hear the high tide sliding along the banked up shingle. This was the sound of home. Eyes drifting from the water, she'd lost over the profile of the neglected boat shed. Fronds of willowy grass flowed over the tops of its gutters. She remembered the special branch calling to the house. No search took place was around the time of the hunger strikes. Late that night, she'd heard Uncle Tom rummaging in the old boat shed. All his father's tools were there. Thomas, her grandfather, the man with two pensions, a British Army pension from World War I, skills reapplied then to earn an old IRA pension. Some people never forgave him for claiming both. He said it made him either friend or enemy to one or both sides. It was up to others to decide. Meanwhile, he set himself up as a boat builder. When the boat building stopped, the inside of the shed was always maintained. As a child, Paul used to slip in when Uncle Tom was not looking. She'd curl up on the camp bed, look out of the sea and read or draw. She did not dare touch anything. There was a reason she was not allowed in, the dangerous tools. But if she ignored them, she wasn't breaking any rules. Lately, she had started to make it her space again, using boat offcuts for her design desk and clearing a space to set up her loom. She had found her childish boat sketches. Images filled with a childhood thirst for adventure and change. Valley Boy was a town used to being forgotten. It gave people something to give out about in this village where nothing happened. They struggled hard to counteract the strangled street left behind when the trouble started and the northerners stopped coming. They continued to dress the old bleached bones with flowers and murals, trying to disguise the ad hoc caravan park and now lonely holiday homes overlooking the deserted harbour. Then the storm came and wrecked the pier. 
Then the bypass was built. Traffic could go by without even breathing Ballyboy. People ebbed out and never came back. Ballyboy had shrugged its shoulders and got on quietly as best it could. Paul had left for university in Belfast, a grey town that still stank of troubles emanating from the time before she was even born. Now she was back. She told herself it had to be temporary. Her eyes squinted awake as the sun squeezed through the narrow strip of curtain gap. The smell of the rising sun lifted her mood and she rolled the duvet to one side. Breakfast for her and Uncle Tom and it was time to head to Kylie's. Bye Uncle Tom, bye love. Grabbing the keys she departed quickly pulling the cottage door behind her. Six days a week she opened the shop at seven o'clock. Finishing college six months ago she'd only intended to stay in Ballyboy for the summer then head off after officially graduating. She'd not come back to Belfast for the ceremony. Uncle Tom did not want to go and she didn't want to return alone. Her gentle uncle had got cross with her. What would I be doing crossing that border? And mumbled about nothing but grief. Her mother had lived for two years in Belfast, coming home to Ballyboy in the late 70s, a pregnant soldier's widow. Her husband's army pension was saved for Paula's education. She was never going to stay in Belfast after graduating. Like anywhere, jobs were sparse, and in Belfast, art was expected to be political. Some jobs were too. She'd come home to supposedly sleepy Ballyboy. Uncle Tom was not too steady on his feet. She could keep an eye on him and get a job in Kylie's. She told herself she stayed here for Uncle Tom. Uncle Tom said he didn't need her. Paula thought he could be right. She quelled this thought. If it developed, she would have to leave Bally Boy. That's what people did. Everyone emigrated. That wasn't what she wanted. She wondered how Tom encouraged her to do art so she'd have to emigrate for a job. Sometimes she had the feeling that maybe she wasn't quite welcome in his house where he and her mother had reared her. In his mind, she had already moved on. It was as though he had banished her footsteps from the sand. Each morning she was soothed by the deserted street as she walked down to open up. She loved being the first to read the newspapers, that feeling of knowing things before others did. She rubbed her head and smiled at the lumpy hair. It started as a dye job that went terribly wrong and she decided to keep it shaved. It gave her a markedness she did not have before. It was funny what you could get used to after years of trying to blend in from being too tall. Paula was born tall but grew out of it with the development of puberty. This brought a relief from the expectations foisted on her to be the fastest runner and the highest jumper. It assumed she'd always be in the back row of the choir and the school photographs. Either that or she'd have to sit in the front with legs knotted under her. Actually, her legs were not that long. Her height was in her torso. It was a family thing. It meant that when she sat, she looked taller. Reared by Uncle Tom and her mother, they'd always kept a low profile in the village and she felt her height brought unwanted attention. Once she had heard them whispering when they thought she was asleep in bed. You know the drill, head down, say nothing. She started to walk with her head down and her mother gave out to her for stooping. You've nothing to be ashamed of. Paula wondered what it was she should not be ashamed of. That's brilliant, Maeve. I'm starting to find out. <laughs> I hope you continue on with that one. Don't find out what Paula should be ashamed of or not. Um, that's some fantastic readings there from from the open mic section. Um, I just have a comment here. It's from Helen um, Gillard, and I think it's important that I, I add this to the conversation tonight. Um, she just says, thank you to everyone for remembering Dermot and his body of work so graciously this evening. Warm and good wishes to everyone from Helen and the Healy family. So I think that's lovely. Um, and thank you to Dr. Keith Hopper, Mary O'Malley, Brian Layden for joining us this evening for this amazing discussion. Um, for everybody joining us on Zoom, um, for Ray Cohn for the beautiful music, for, for all three open mic participants and for Studio Row for looking after the tech side. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this evening and I hope you discover more Dermot Healy work and um, you can check our library catalogue to find more as well. Um, thanks everyone, I think that's it. And we'll see you in, at the end of February for our next edition. So um, we'll see you then. Thanks. Thank you everybody.